Greetings, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kira Epstein. I am the program coordinator at the New School at Commonweal. I am here today with Catherine Cummings from the Center for Humans and Nature to welcome back our host, Christine Lukasavich, and today's guest, author and journalist, Wapgizhik Rice. Okay, for those of you who are new to us, the New School at Commonweal is an arts and lectures program. We offer virtual and in-person conversations and art shows and other performances. Uh, our topics that we like to look at are nature, culture, and inner life. We've been doing this for about 15 years and we have hundreds of podcasts and videos available. So this is the third and last conversation in our What Stories Does the Land Hold series. I know I say this every time, but this is a wonderful team to work with, and it really has been a joy to work with the Center for Humans and Nature and with Christine on this series. So if you missed the first two conversations with Amy Shwanda and Tanya Rucka, you can watch or listen. The new school's website is tns.commonweal.org. And we have What Stories Does the Land Hold playlists on YouTube and SoundCloud. And you can find all of the podcasts on our feeds on Apple Podcasts and Spotify as well. So we want to thank you, of course, for being with us to hear the conversation. It's great to have you and to see all the interest in this series. Christine did a great job putting this together and curating it. Again, you can also find our recordings on the New School SoundCloud, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify feeds. Ken Adams is behind the scenes, making all this run smoothly and producing our recordings. Thank you, Ken. And I also want to thank Erin Williams for helping with the chat. She does a great job. Okay, I think that's it. So I'm going to turn it over to Catherine Kasuf Cummings, the Center for Human and Nature's Digital Press Managing Editor. Thank you. Thank you, Kira. Oh, I'm glad to be here with all of you. Um, and I'm looking forward to this conversation today, especially as it's the last in this terrific series. Um, I'm joining from the city of Chicago, which is the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary homelands of the people of the Council of the Three Fires. That's the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Odawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Ho-Chunk nations, for whom this land is a place of exchange, of gathering and healing. And as Kira mentioned, I'm an editor with the Center for Humans and Nature, which is a nonprofit that's based in Libertyville, Illinois. Um, the land that is right here on screen with me is, um, is part of the centers, um, the land that, that we are um, situated on in Libertyville. And Libertyville is not, not that far from Chicago, Chicagoland area. Um, we foster an exchange of ideas and um, really towards a remembrance of responsibilities between humans and nature. And we do this through publications and through land practices that contribute to resilience and regeneration. We're so grateful um, to be partnering with the New School at Commonweal to share this series of conversations. In my work with the center, I produce the Questions for a Resilient Future, um, that's a series that is part of Humans in Nature Digital Press, as Kira um, mentioned. So Questions for a Resilient Future nurtures a public practice of questions, and it's a space for refining our responses to the challenges of our time with humility, with curiosity, and in community. If you visit humansinnature.org, you can explore our questions, including what stories does the land hold, the question which brings us together today, and which was created by our host and editorial fellow with the center, Christine Lukasavich. I'm delighted to introduce Christine. She is Algonquin and mixed settler ancestry and lives in unceded Algonquin territory next to what is now known as Algonquin Provincial Park in Ontario, Canada. Christine is the owner and executive consultant of Wasea Consulting and Wasea Cultural Tours two small businesses dedicated to reviving and celebrating indigenous ancestral knowledge and culture-based practices through educational opportunities. She is the co-owner of Algonquin Motors, 
a woman-led motorcycle clothing company honoring the spirit of unceded Algonquin territory. And Christine is currently writing her thesis to complete her MA in Indigenous Studies at Trent University. Until recently, Christine also served as Executive Director of Native, Native Land Digital. That's the organization between native-land.ca. It's an Indigenous-led non-for-profit dedicated to providing a digital platform for Indigenous peoples to share knowledge about their cultures, traditions, territories, and knowledge systems across the world. In all her work, Christine focuses on creating spaces for Indigenous peoples to share their knowledges, both in physical and in digital spaces, and encouraging the re-emergence of ancestral kinship ties. In 2021, Christine was an editorial fellow with the Center for Humans and Nature, during which she, pub she published the series, What Stories Does the Land Hold? Um, as this is the final event in our series, I want to add here that she's an inspiring and thoughtful collaborator, um, and it's been a great joy to work with her on this question. And I'm pleased to share that Christine is now serving on our press's editorial advisory board. And so she will continue to shape the publishing work that we do. Um, so with that, uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Christine, for sharing of your gifts so generously. I look forward to the conversation today. Jimmy Gwich, thank you so much, Kate. Um, from here, I will uh, I will introduce myself. So, Kwe Ani Bojo, Christine Adishnakas, Madawaska Zibi and Donjaba, Haji Jack and Dodem, O Mama Winani Nishnabe Kweyandao. My name is Christine. I am from the Crane Clan. Um, I am Madawaskarini Algonquin, and I live in my ancestral territory, um, which is now. Well, most of it is now covered by what is uh, also known as Algonquin Provincial Park in Ontario. So today I am not at home. I am in Catalan territory in what is now known as Barcelona, Spain, uh, visiting some friends. So coming, coming at you from a bit further away today, but very happy to be here alongside um, Wab Gijic Rice, who... Um, I've been following his work for at least a decade, so being in this space and being able to chat today is um, pretty, pretty, pretty remarkable. It's it's a moment worth celebrating. So to um, to kind of talk a little bit about the what stories does a land hold series. Um, it was intentionally created as a space for eight Indigenous authors to come together to answer that question. Um, what stories does the land hold? What are the stories that you know? How do you know the place where you are? How do you know your homeland? Um, there were eight uh, um, Indigenous authors from around the world, including um, Dr. Amy Shawanda, um, Maori artist Tanya Rucka, um, as well as a number of others who graciously donated their time to. Um, to share their stories and really talk about the places that they're from and about the work that they do and how they understand their place in the world. Um, this question, what stories does a land hold is one that plays along in my mind, whether I'm at home or whether I'm away traveling and just, you know, do you wonder who else has been there? Do you wonder what the stories are? Do you wonder how people would have known that place long before it ever looked the way that we know it today? Um, and really wanting to do a dive into that and think like, you know, helping people to be a bit more mindful, to understand places, um, you know, as places of ancestors, maybe not our direct ancestors, but of someone's ancestors, but even further, um, as our future generations as well, too, um, and both human and more than human relations as well. So... Um, I do want to say chimigwech to each of those authors for trusting me to help them bring uh, their work and stories into the world. My gratitude to both Brooke and uh, Kate at the Center for Humans and Nature, as well as Aaron too, um, to Ken and Kira for making these gatherings happen. Um, and also, I want to give a huge shout out to two of my oldest friends, um, Sam Butwell and Alyssa Barty, for their editorial and artistic contributions to this series. They've made it even more beautiful, and they make my life even more beautiful every day. So, as I mentioned, um, you know, I've been a fan of Bob's work for quite a long time, starting from the point when he was a journalist with CBC. Um, for those of you who are not from Canada, uh, CBC is the uh, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and uh, 
the radio station I listen to almost every single morning, particularly the Ottawa station. So about 10 years ago or more, maybe now, um, I, Wab, I didn't even mention to, this to you yet, but we were at um, at an event and I was watching you go around and kind of do, you know, do your journalist thing and kind of make your way around the room. But what I had noticed is that you, um, people were really happy to speak with you. People re were really, really happy to, you know, lend a few moments of their time. And I thought, you know, this is really cool. And very shortly after, you had made the transition out of being a journalist into full-time author. So I thought, whoa, this is really cool. I need to follow where this guy's going in life. And here we are. So it is my pleasure to introduce Wab Gijik Rice. Um, Wab Gijik is an author and journalist from Mosoxing First Nation. He's written three fiction titles and his short stories and essays have been published in numerous anthologies. His most recent novel, Moon of the Crested Snow, was published in 2018 and became a national bestseller. He graduated from Toronto Metropolitan University, University's journalism program in 2002 and spent most of his journalism career with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation as a video journalist and radio host. He left CBC in 2020 to focus on his literary career. Um, he lives in Sudbury, Ontario with his wife and three sons. The third is a very new addition, so just a couple of months old. So that's really exciting for Wob and his, his wife as well. Um, his forthcoming novel, Moon of the Turning Leaves, uh, will be published in October 2023. So that's very exciting for all of us to be able to read the second installment um, to Moon of the Crested Snow. Um, Wab, I'll open it up to you here if you'd like to say hello to everyone. Okay, Shmigwesh, Christine. I uh, really appreciate uh, the the wonderful opening and your your sharing of uh, our past crossing uh, before. That's very cool to reflect on those times. Bojo, um, Kinoya. Uh, hi, everybody. Wab Gijing, Dijnikaz, Makwat, and Nodem, Osaksing, Ndonjaba, and Nishnabe, Minwa, Jagana, Shinda, Minwa, and Swakmak, and Dida. Uh, my name is Wab Gijek Grace. Uh, you may call me Wab for short. I'm a member of the Bear Clan of the Anishinaabek of Wasoxing First Nation. That's an island community on Georgian Bay beside Perry Sound, Ontario. I'm of Anishinaabe and Canadian descent. My dad is from the Res and my mom is from town. And I currently reside in Sudbury, Ontario, which is also known as Swakamuk. It's the traditional territory of Atikamek Shing and Anishinaabek. And where I live now and where I'm originally from are lands that are part of the Robinson-Huron Treaty, which was signed in 1850, uh, which of course means that it predates Canadian Confederation. I just want to say it's a huge honor to be here with you all today. I'm very humbled to have the invitation to share uh, my journey and uh, especially to reflect on uh, the writing that Christine asked me to do uh, last year or the year before. I can't remember exactly when, but... Uh, you know, the, this time blurs together, you know, uh, since 2020, right? But uh, yeah, I'm just really excited to be here and really looking forward to chatting with you, Christine. So thanks again for having me. Chimi Glitch, thank you, Wab, for, for being here. So diving right in. So Wab, your contribution to the What Stories Does a Land Hold series is titled Stories and Scars and the Markings. Um, the first time that I opened this piece, I, I had a moment where I went, wow, this is one of the authors whose work I enjoy the most. And here I am, one of the very first people to read this. And what a what a cool moment that is. Like, oh, I need this is like, you know, I have to be really, really mindful of this moment and bring it into the world in a good way. So Chimi Gwich for trusting me to kind of bring that to where it is today. <clears throat> so in your piece. Um, you talk about like the marks that are on the land and the stories that are on the land, the ways we know the land um, and really how those stories connect us to land. Some of our really, really old stories that are still continued um, generation to generation through that oral tradition and also will continue to be carried through to those future generations as well. And you talk about Nana Bush and these old stories, and they help to explain even how geological features are um, are created, like different islands and things, and, and really how they came to be. But you also talk about the scars on the land, um, and you directly confront, you know, our forced alienation from our homelands um, as a resort of things like colonial resource extraction. So those are those scars. 
Um, I will say both, Wab, you and I are both Anishinaabek and Canadian, like mixed settler um, ancestries. And both of our families found these ways to, to exist, coexist in these spaces and find ways to care for the places that we now call home. And I think, you know, for, for me, certainly one side of my narrative was always the dominant one. Um, living in a settler town, I did not grow up on the res, but living in a settler town, that was kind of what I what I always sort of did and what it was defaulted to. But when I was around eight or nine years old, um, I had a teacher who took me under her wing and brought me to a powwow, brought me to a, a powwow in Kitagon Zibi. And from there, I kind of went, okay, there's there's more to this. Um, and it really kind of set me on my path of starting to relearn those stories, those stories of place and those stories of ancestors. Um, but in particular, in your piece, what you talk about is, you know, we are in our dystopian future. You mentioned that your grandmother had said, you know, we've, we've faced our apocalypse. We have faced this through um, children being stolen from homes, um, through us being displaced from our homelands and so on. But it's also we're celebrating, too, that us as Anishinaabeg people, every moment we are resisting colonialism, we are experiencing that revitalization of our of our culture um, and really unapologetically taking up that space. And, and it's really neat to to look at it as those storytelling and the sharing of stories that is a way that we are able to take up space and sharing those stories with the world. Um, and so knowing that a lot of your work through your journalism career, but then also through a lot of the work that you do yourself as an author, um, you hold space for Indigenous authors in many ways, um, including your Storykeepers podcast. Um, I'm wondering, can you tell us a little bit about Storykeepers podcast, how you came to create it, uh, maybe some of the guests who you speak with or other works by Indigenous authors? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, well, it was actually the brainchild of my friend Jennifer David, who is a Cree. Uh, she lives in Ottawa. Uh, she's originally from Northern Ontario. Uh, she had this idea to put the spotlight on indigenous literature uh specifically you know the both modern and i guess classic works uh by indigenous authors and uh, she had kicked this idea around for a few years and <clears throat> she asked if i wanted to help her make it a reality back when i was still at cbc and it just wasn't possible because of my cbc workload and because of other restrictions of being a cbc employee right uh, but when I left uh, to work full time as an author in 2020, she circled back and asked if I uh, wanted to give it a shot with her then. And uh, I, I think getting into podcasting was a bit of a foregone conclusion, you know, coming from CBC. I think it was sort of expected that I would try it at some point. And I wasn't sure exactly what shape that would take, but having something very specific uh, and that fell in line with what I was doing, you know, career wise, uh, really made sense to me. So we started, you know, planning uh, and mapping out just how exactly a podcast about Indigenous literature would work. And she really wanted it to have kind of like a book club feel, you know, to talk about a specific book once a month and to invite another Indigenous person uh, onto the podcast to talk about it with us. Um, we targeted Indigenous writers at first, but I think we branched it out to, you know, academics, other artists, and so on after that, right? Uh, so it's been really fun, you know. Uh, another thing that has really appealed to me with it is, you know, the, the lack of limits, you know, working at CBC for so long. I was, you know, confined to time and space, essentially, right? And a lot of that had to be scripted, you know, according to the time. But with Story Keepers, you know, we can just sort of let her rip, <laughs> which is a lot of fun. Uh, so it's been great, um, you know. And for me, uh, when I was, I guess, a fledgling author and trying to get my work out there, I was really nurtured and encouraged by a lot of Indigenous authors, you know, specifically Lee Maracle and Richard Wagamese, Richard Van Camp, and so on. So, you know, it's my responsibility, I believe, to keep widening that circle for all Indigenous writers. 
uh, especially the ones who are just starting out on their journeys. And I think Story Keepers has been a really, uh, hopefully, uh, a, a viable outlet for that in terms of promoting Indigenous uh, literature and storytelling in that way. <clears throat> I should say, though, this is not, uh, we haven't publicly announced this yet, but we will be winding it down eventually uh, this year just because uh, it's really hard to maintain, you know, the schedule with our uh, busy schedules, the Jennifer's work and, and my work and my home home life and so on. But uh, yeah, we're just really honored that people have come along for the ride. And, and if you haven't checked it out yet, you can find uh, past episodes on our website or however you get podcasts. And we hope you enjoy it. One of the things that I love the most, um, I think it was one of the very first episodes of Story Keepers, uh, you talked about um, kind of the people who have encouraged you to really take a deep dive into reading works by Indigenous authors. And so really, you know, what role have Indigenous storytellers played in your life? And sort of how did you how did you come to realize that there are so many wonderful and brilliant Indigenous storytellers out there? Well, I was fortunate to grow up in my community in a really crucial time of cultural revival back in the 1980s. Uh, there were a, a lot of devastating tragedies and some ongoing traumas in our community as a result of being displaced and colonized people. And that manifested itself in 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 violent deaths, you know, in in premature deaths, and ongoing abuses, uh, substance use, and so on, right? Uh, but by the time my generation, I think, came about in the eighties, our our parents and the elders in our community had really had enough of that, and they turned back to the ways that had been really stolen from them or beaten out of them and worked really hard to revive ceremonies like sweat lodges and bring back celebrations like powwows and so on, and really encourage that proud sharing of stories and cultural realities and our history that had been denied generations for, you know, close to 100 years, right? So I had a front row seat, essentially, to that cultural renaissance of sorts. And what really compelled me to learn more about my Anishinaabe heritage was the stories, was what our elders were sharing firsthand with us, things that they were once again able to share proudly, you know, whereas when they were in residential schools or just out in, you know, mainstream Canadian society, they risk their lives and safety essentially by sharing these things because, you know, they were forbidden, of course, under the Indian Act. And they were also, you know, violently reacted to within, you know, the residential school system and, and the wider uh, assimilative Canadian project, I guess you could call it. So uh, it was yeah, that the elders who would come into our school and tell us the Nanabush stories, the trickster stories, or even just, you know, our grandparents and our aunts and uncles who once again were able to share community and family history with us, you know, things that they were led to believe were obsolete and useless as a result of being oppressed people. And I was just very fortunate to have that a uh, foundational part of my upbringing. And I'm just so thankful that there were people in my community who really made a commitment to raising us with that knowledge. So that's really where it began, is just having that foundation of storytelling there. And it was a very organic, very communal thing. It wasn't, you know, one or two people um, seeking any sort of like glory or recognition for doing that. It was a communal effort. And to this day, I think a lot of us, you know, my generation specifically, who are in their 40s, um, have this very firm knowledge as a result of those efforts. So again, yeah, I just express gratitude on a daily basis for that upbringing. And knowing that, you know, this transmission of story from generation to generation, at some point you become the storyteller. Um, and so if you were to kind of pinpoint a moment or a, a part of your life where you felt comfortable, you know, acknowledging yourself as a storyteller, when when was that? When did that moment happen for you? Oh, <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's an interesting question because 
Uh, it, it, it may be a little hard to pinpoint, but I think that's testament to that organic uh, teaching that we had growing up. Um, I was a really shy little kid, and and I don't think I would have felt confident enough as, you know, like an eight, nine, 10 year old to get up and speak in front of people. But um, this was in the 80s, right? And this was at when, you know, up here in Canada, you know, Elijah Harper was pushing back. Uh, against the Meech Lake Accord, which, you know, proposed constitutional overhauls to the detriment of Indigenous people. And then shortly after, the resistance of Oka happened. So I saw all these revolutionary things happening, right? And and I saw how that really invigorated the people around me. And and I think that really uh, inspired me to, to speak up in my own right in, in some ways. And, and I guess, yeah, like uh, speaking my truth was something I saw people around me doing. And I guess I came out of that shy shell eventually. And when I left uh, the community, like when, when we went to high school off reserve, um, that sort of came into sharper focus, the need to really push back against the wrong narrative that had painted us as you know, violent people or tragic people or inept people or obstacles to Canadian progress or whatever else, right? Uh, because I saw those mythological narratives uh, really echoed within, you know, the mainstream public education system in high school. So I think that really, uh, that was more motivation to think be a storyteller. And it's not just like telling the stories of our people, you know, those cultural stories. It's about speaking our truth, right? And I saw the importance of that early on. And I knew that, you know, we had a big hill to climb. This was back in the 1990s when I was in high school, right? So, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, became, I guess, um, empowered to share those things. Uh, and then getting into literature was a, a totally... Uh, happenstance kind of thing um, that I think we'll, we'll probably talk about later. But yeah, coming into storytelling was just a result of, you know, the being inspired by the people around me. And I know, you know, this is from, from social media and following you on social media. I know that Lee Maracle, um played a, played a big role in supporting you. Um, and she is, she remains one of the driving forces behind my work. And, you know, if there's sort of, I don't think to me, no one will quite measure up to Lee and no one will ever have the same laugh as Lee. Um, I was lucky <laughs> to meet her. I was lucky to meet her a few times. Um, but just, you know, what what influence has she had on your work and in what ways did she support you? Because I know she I had heard her in book talks and things um, speaking about your work and really holding you up and just curious about your relationship. Yeah, well, you know, I guess it began with me reading her work when I was younger and and really understanding how revolutionary she was then. Uh, and then, you know, when I finally became a published author myself, when my first book, uh, Midnight Sweat Lodge, came out in uh, 2011, um, I, it was the first time I'd met her. Uh, the First Nations House at the University of Toronto invited me to do like a book launch of sorts there. And, you know, I hadn't done anything like that before. Um, I didn't really know what to expect, you know, despite like having years of, of I guess, on camera experience of being a broadcaster and so on. It was a totally different realm for me. Right. And I was very nervous for sure, uh, because like I was like, what do you do? You go up and read and you, you answer questions or what happens after that, you know? But what what they did, and and I give full credit to Susan Blight, who was at uh, First Nations House back then. Uh, she invited Lee Miracle to to do a reading with me, you know, to be there in terms of support, I guess you could say. So uh, yeah, she was there um, doing a reading. I, I can't remember which book she read from at the time. It might have been a poetry collection. Um, but she went up and did her thing, and you know, I was just inspired by seeing her you know, read and, you know, engage with the audience and, you know, be like the anti-figure that she is, right? And that really like eased my nerves. And I got up there and did my thing. And then, you know, the the cheesy jokes I was trying to make, you know, she was laughing in the front row, her, her iconic laugh. And uh, it was just such a lovely way to sort of, I guess, break into, you know, the public literary sphere. 
And since then, you know, she was always really supportive and she would email me and we would have these conversations here and there. She had all kinds of great advice around writing and she really helped me out through my first novel, which is called Legacy. Um, I had some, you know, it's a very heavy book about some very, uh, you know, traumatic experiences. Um, And I wasn't really sure how to go about confronting some of those things and writing about them in a respectful and proper way. But she was just so uh, lovely in terms of nurturing, I guess, what I wanted to do and wanted to be as a writer, as a literary storyteller. And yeah, that uh, relationship was ongoing. And, and you know, we uh, have lost so much with her leaving this sort of physical realm. But, you know, thankfully, her work lives on. Just wish we could have had more of it. Right. But um, just very grateful that she was a part of my life for a few years there. And when you were talking about the book talk, I could hear her. I heard her tell the story a few times of her first book talk. And she said to her, her publisher, she goes, well, why do I need to do a book talk? Don't these people read? Like, <laughs> <laughs> she, she certainly was was a force and um, just so much brilliance that she's brought into the world. Yeah. Um, so I know um, that your family plays a, a major role in influencing kind of the work that you do and, and also, you know, mentoring you and gently pushing you along and inspiring you. Um, so, you know, I know through one of the um, unreserved episodes that you had hosted a few years ago. So for folks who are not, again, not from Canada, see. BC has an incredible um, Indigenous radio show called Unreserved, um, hosted by Rosanna Deerchild, and Wav was a guest, um, a guest host for an episode, talking along the lines of um, Indigenous masculinity, and uh, you know, just thinking, you know, what what kind of an influence does your father, or say, some of the male figures play in your in your life and in your work? Uh, very very big influence for sure um but i think in terms of understanding masculinity it's been the women in my life who've helped me really know my role as a a male in my family and in my community mostly because there were more women who who raised me and who had that influence and that's not to say my father has not been a huge figure he's he's just been massive he is you know one of my confidants he is is a huge inspiration to me and he's really one of my cultural go-tos right um but to speak about him he you know had to figure a lot of it out on his own because his own father died tragically when when my dad was only five years old Um, It was an alcohol related mishap. And my grandmother was left to raise five kids on her own. And then she eventually adopted two more. So it was, I think, her um, guidance that really helped my dad and his siblings, I guess, grow up and ease into themselves as young res people. in a community that was obviously still trying to figure out what being the Schnabe meant, you know, back in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. So my dad, I think, really had no template to read from. There was no blueprint for being a dad that he could access. And he was going through some, I think, uh, very challenging times of self-reflection, you know, being introspective as to what it meant to be in the Schnabe in, in the 70s and 80s, right? Uh, But, you know, I give him full credit for figuring it out, for breaking a lot of the cycles that he had to survive on his own, you know, Uh, and really being, you know, a kind, respectful, loving parent when he had maybe only half of the, um, I guess, privilege of of, uh, of of parenthood, right? Like he had my grandmother to, to only raise him and she did a phenomenal job. You know, she was a huge influence on me too. But my dad had the support too of, of all the women in his life, specifically my mom, who was a white lady from town who moved to the res to raise a family with him, uh, his sisters, his aunts, uh, and so on, right? So uh, I, I think I was raised with some pretty good values in terms of how to be a man and how to be a respectful citizen. 
and and really the respect that is due to everyone around us who is not a man right to the people who have been marginalized and oppressed even within our own communities you know because the patriarchy has been such a huge influence on our communities too as a result of being colonized right so so women two spirit people have been pushed to the side and and i was raised with the importance of holding those people up and then bringing them into the circle and making sure that their voices are heard and so on so that's what masculinity means to me it, it means um putting the spotlight on everybody else but myself because even though i'm from you know a so-called marginalized demographic as an Indigenous man, you know, I still uh, benefit from the patriarchy myself as a man, you know. So, yeah, I had some very nuanced understandings of what being a man meant, spe specifically from an Anishinaabe perspective. Uh, so it's my responsibility as a dad now uh, of three boys to try to raise them in the same way, to ensure that they uh, are respectful um, that they step aside when they need to and that they uphold, you know, everybody in their lives who deserves their voices heard. Uh, so, yeah, it was it was really fun to be able to, uh, I guess, reflect on all that and amplify other voices in that unreserved episode. It was, um, yeah, it was definitely a career highlight at CBC for sure. And then speaking of, you know, incredible women in your life, um, you and your wife, Sarah, are now raising three boys. Um, and I know that, you know, you are surrounding your your kids with this Nishnavik love and then also being able to integrate these knowledges and languages into your daily lives. Um, so what does it mean to you to be able to then raise your sons in that way that had started off, you know, with those previous generations? And here you are now carrying this on. Well, it's uh, it's daunting for sure. <laughs> but at the same time, it's celebratory uh, because, you know, they have a firmer understanding of who they are as Nishnabek much more than my wife and I did. You know, she is just a few years younger than me, but she grew up in the same era, right, in the 80s. And, you know, she, her mom is from the res, from Garden River First Nation, or, and her dad's from town, from Bruce Mines. So she grew up off the res. Um, but we have both seen that evolution of awareness of Indigenous communities, people, and issues uh, over the course of the past four decades. And when I compare uh, the general, I think, attitude towards Indigenous people in Canada back then to now is greatly improved. Of course, there's still a long way to go, but, you know, for my parents, I think there was probably some debate and discussion that needed to happen around what they wanted to impart upon us, um, how they needed to ensure we were safe practicing our culture and celebrating who we were as an Anishinaabe, because, of course, you know, racism thrived much more back then than it does now. Uh, and, and for us, uh, though, like safety, of course, is an issue. There is racism out there. Uh, but I think there is a better awareness amongst our children's non-Indigenous peers of who they are as people and what their history is. So I think we are supported and empowered by uh, an awakening society, fortunately. And I think that really helps us. Uh, create an atmosphere at home that is proudly Nishnabe, you know, hopefully on a daily basis. That's not to say that everything we do is Nishnabe because we both mostly speak English and, you know, there's not like a specific action we do every day that I think makes us Nishnabe, but um, they have that baseline knowledge much more and, and it's much thicker than ours was uh, when we were that age, right? So uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful uh, opportunity. It's an honor, uh, but it also is a privilege, um, especially for me, because, because I was raised so close with my culture and a lot of other people haven't been as a result of residential schools and oppression and so on. Right. So um, it's exciting. Yeah. And, and you know, our, our, our first son wears his hair in a braid every day to school and uh, our middle son is growing his hair along, too. So, yeah, we'll see how their childhoods unfold. Absolutely. I think it's incredible the way that you're raising your kids. And, oh, thank you. Um, 
So to to shift gears a tiny little bit, I'd like to chat about Moon of the Crusted Snow. So this is your, you know, the the kind of like the the really big novel. Mm. Um, again, didn't didn't mention this to you prior to this call, but I kind of wanted to save it for this moment. But I knew this book was coming out, and I was so excited for it. Um, I got it as a Christmas gift the first year that it came out, and I was so excited to dig into it. And I got like a quarter way through the book. But that first night, I had the worst nightmares. I'm I'm not really someone who has nightmares. So I actually had to set it down for like a good year until I was ready to come back to it. Um, So for folks who have not read Wob's Wob's novel yet, I do really encourage you to to read this. Um, It is a really brilliant book that speaks about um, indigenous resilience in that kind of apocalyptic moment, kind of when things are falling apart, um, but really how how important community is, how important family is, and how important it is to continue to look um, to those ancestral teachings and bringing them forward into you know into those present moments and passing them on to those future generations, um, and so you know, thinking of those themes of like of blood memory coming through is that, you know, we were able to kind of step, step back into that practice that we've always sort of known and, and turning to the land um, and knowing that our ancestors are always supporting us as well too. So wanting to know where did that story come from and are there parts of your lives or lives of your relatives that you were drawing on a bit with this novel? Uh, well, thanks for that, Christine. I'm glad you you enjoyed it. And sorry about the nightmares early on. I, I hear that regularly. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was, uh, you know, I, I didn't anticipate the book to get the response that it had. And that ultimately, you know, uh, allowed me to quit my day job, so to speak, and, and focus full time on writing now. And I'm very privileged to be able to do that. The story itself, um, really the main source of, I guess, motivation or inspiration was uh, a big blackout that happens uh, in 2003. And I think uh, the audience who lives in the eastern side of the continent will remember that. It was um, uh, the middle of August uh, that year when this widespread blackout happened, right? Knocking out power to, you know, all the big cities like Toronto, Montreal, Ottawa, New York, Boston, Cleveland, Detroit, and so on. I was living in Toronto at the time, but I was actually back home in Wasoxing visiting, uh, house sitting for my dad and stepmom who were on summer holidays. So I was there with uh, my two younger brothers. Uh, the one lived in Ottawa, but he had come back to help uh, host it too. And our youngest brother, who was just still in high school at the time. Uh, so the power went out and we didn't think much of it until like hours later when it was still off and we got bored, right? <laughs> and so uh, it was like the sunny summer day. So it was kind of unusual to have this, this power outage. So we got in the car and we drove into Perry Sound, which is only about a 10 minute drive away. And we saw that the power was out there too. And we thought that was strange. So we saw some people we knew on the main street and talked to them. And one of them had heard on the radio that it was this uh, massive blackout, you know, tens of millions of people were without power, you know, in this summer day. Uh, So we got freaked out. We got kind of scared and we got in the car and drove back to the res. And when we got there, we like went into full survival mode. (laughs) We did an inventory of all the food in the cupboards and we went and collected firewood out back because we know the, we knew the electric stove would be useless. And, you know, we just made all these plans to, to, to get food and to stay safe and so on. And as night fell, uh, we were talking more about what we wanted to do. And we started thinking about the people around us, you know, uh, who we should go check in on, like our grandmother, aunts and uncles. And then we started thinking about people we could go to for help, you know, who are resourceful, like, you know, had hunting skills or, or other, you know, medicinal harvesting skills from the bush and so on. Right. So the more we thought of that, the more comforting it was to be there. And, and that sort of unease uh, was essentially faded away as the night went on. 
And uh, the next morning we woke up and the power was still out and we were going to go fishing because we're like, okay, I guess we got to fish all the time now. This is what we're going to eat because, you know, the power's out for good. The world's going to end. But before we left, the power came back on and we turned on the TV and turned on CBC and uh, saw, you know, what was happening in Toronto and Montreal and so on. And they had a hypothesis as to how the blackout happened and, you know, within about an hour, our whole survival plan sort of just, you know, went, you know, disappeared, right? <laughs> we didn't really worry about it anymore. But that moment really stuck with me. And I went back to Toronto a couple of days later to go to work. And I, I learned that, you know, it was slightly more hectic in the city. It wasn't like outright chaos or anything like that. But I thought, you know, if this kind of thing ever happens again, I'm definitely going back to the res. I'm not sticking around the city. And uh, yeah, that, that's where the seed was first planted. I, I thought it'd be cool to write about this someday, about, uh, you know, this world ending blackout from the perspective of a First Nation. About a year after that, I was back home in Wasoxing visiting and I was visiting with my grandmother. And uh, I think it was like coming up on the year anniversary of the blackout and we were talking about it. And uh, I was like, yeah, that was pretty wild, eh, Graham? You know, like, I thought I thought the world was was done. I thought we're, you know, going to be out of power for good, and I was going to be chaos. And she's like, yeah, I wasn't too worried, you know. <laughs> and then she said, you know, that kind of thing we've lived through over and over again. And then she reminded me about, you know, our own family's history of being displaced from the mainland and being forced out onto the island. And I wrote about this in, in the piece that I, I wrote for you. And a version of that sort of discussion ended up in Moon of the Crested Snow as well. Just that reminder of Indigenous nations having survived apocalypses multiple times over and the resilience to pick up the pieces and move on, despite having, you know, a damaged culture, damaged history, hanging on to the threads that remain to weave something together that's equally beautiful, but maybe not necessarily the same, right? So those were the the two big things that I think pushed me to to writing the book, and uh, I didn't actually start writing it till you know about ten years after that. Um, but it was something that just sort of um, gestated over time, and uh, it was really fun to write, and uh, just sent me on this very fortunate journey that I'm on now, uh, which has taken me to writing part two, which will be out later this year. And so thinking again, kind of. Um, these these sort of instances or these experiences, they happen sort of time and again, right? And and of course we we look at the different apocalyptic experiences that we as Indigenous people um, continue to experience, right? We we are living in those po- post apocalyptic times, mm-hmm. um, but you know finding it kind of a little bit funny how on social media when the pandemic hit it's almost like more people started to pick up moon of the crested snow um Mm -hmm. because it was sort of this thread that we could all um sort of this thread this narrative this story that we could all cling to and say you know here here is what an experience like this could play out like you know and you you really go through those those difficult times um those times when your you know your lives are threatened perhaps um but then also Toward the end of the book, you have this incredible period of of hope. Um, and so, you know, and I don't want to give too much away about Moon of the Crested Snow to anyone who hasn't read it yet. Um, but did a lot of folks reach out to you during the pandemic and really talk about that, like that thread of hope that they would have got from the book? Uh, yeah, a little bit. I, I, you know, and it, it was definitely strange when the book sort of got a second wind through the pandemic. You know, I didn't really expect that, but I, I like to think that hopefully that's what people gravitated towards. Uh, what I do believe is when books like that, uh, you know, post apocalyptic or dystopian books got more attention, ended up back on the bestseller list in those first months of the pandemic, I think it was because. Stories like that can offer some sort of resolution during a mysterious crisis. And at that point, you know, there was no hint as to how this was all going to end, right? There was no vaccine back then. People were panic buying things at the grocery store. There were these very, uh, very intense lockdowns and so on, right? So, uh, yeah, I think Moon of the Crested Snow can, can provide a glimpse into 
uh, enduring some sort of upheaval and coming out the other side in some way, right? Um, because things do have to end. There has to be some kind of resolution. You know, we can't just sort of be forced into some sort of um, decline in perpetuity, right? There, there's usually something that will pull us out of that. And, and having the historical knowledge of my own people and my own community, I think, uh, definitely helped me through those really tough times uh, during the first bit of the pandemic. And and yeah, like that spirit of hope is something that I think is essential for me as an Indigenous storyteller to include. And that's not to like bring down the rose-colored lenses on everything. Of course, you have to expose all of the detriments, all of the negativity that led us to where we are today. But you know, in the midst of all that, you can find hope. You can find the moments of inspiration that allow, you know, me to have long hair today or my kids to have long hair today or for the language to not totally be gone quite yet and to have, you know, people understand what a sweat lodge is or or how smudge ceremonies work and so on, right? Like that that wasn't widespread knowledge when I was a little kid. So, yeah, I see I see hope in the in the real, like in the in the day to day. And it is, I think, my responsibility to reflect that in the fictional as well. So, so yeah, that's, you know, one of my primary objectives for sure. And so knowing that you are, again, publishing your, your sequel to Moon of the Crossed Snow, so it'll be Moon of the Turning Leaves. Um, can you share a little bit about this story without sharing too much? Um, <laughs> and, and why did you feel it was important to write a sequel? Yeah, uh, well, I, I never intended to write a sequel, to be honest. Uh, when that book was finally published, the first one, I thought, okay, you know, that's exactly the story that I wanted to write. You know, this is what I want to go out into the world. And, you know, I was really happy with it. And uh, I quite literally saw the main characters like riding off into the sunset, you know, <laughs> I thought, OK, I'm, I'm, I'm done with them. You know, they're they're going into the imaginations of readers now and that's where they can live. Right. And part of that was because I, I, I took on a pretty significant role at CBC at the time. I, I got a job as a radio host here in Sudbury. And I thought, well, you know, I won't be able to get back into fiction writing for at least five years. So, you know, th this is just I'm happy with leaving my fiction career on the back burner at this point. Right. But the the response was really good. And and when I was doing the initial initial promotional cycle back in the fall of 2018, people started asking me like in, in Q&A's at literary events if I was going to write a sequel. And because I hadn't planned on it, I would say no. And then I would see how disappointed they'd get <laughs> after I would say no. And I thought, oh, I got to start telling them something else, right? Like I can't, uh, I got to give them at least something, even though I'm not working on it yet. So I started, you know, just saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm sort of thinking about it, but not really. I wasn't really at the time. Uh, but about a year after it came out, uh, my agent uh, said, you know, you really should start thinking about a sequel and I could probably find you a home for it and so on. And, and the wheels really got turning there. And uh, so the idea that I, I came up with was revisiting the community 10 years in the future. So be very careful not to give anything away for those of you who haven't read the first one yet. But uh, one detail about the community in the book is that they were originally from the North shore of Georgian Bay, Lake Huron. And they were pushed to far northern Ontario as a result of the displacement that many Indigenous communities suffered. So in part two, they're uh, still in the north uh, and it takes place 12 years after the blackout or 10 years after the end of the book, um, because there's sort of a two year gap between the story and the epilogue. And they decide that, uh, you know, they've been stationary for too long and that they should go south to see if, in fact, the world has ended and to hopefully reconnect with their um, original homeland on the north shore of Georgian Bay. So they send an exploratory mission of six people to make the journey and uh, they encounter some, um, I, I guess, some wild and wacky things along the way is, is as uh, concisely as I can put it. So, uh, yeah, it was it was uh, really fun to write. It was a huge honor to be able to revisit those characters in that world. 
And I just hope that uh, people will find it a worthwhile read when it's out. I'm certainly looking forward to it. And, and, you know, I read the book twice and I found the second time, um, the second time through really gave me a moment to sit with the ending and just think like, it was kind of like taking a very deep breath after a very, very tense, you know, couple of chapters. Um, so really looking forward to to learning what's next that far down the road. Thank you. So knowing, you know, this this conversation certainly centers around storytelling and the role that you have in making space for other Indigenous storytellers as well, too. Um, but also knowing that, you know, we need other things in our life that help to uplift us and, and to kind of keep us feeling charged, shall we say. Um, I know there are two things in life that you're quite passionate about. I was going to write the maple leaves, but then I thought that could always be a bit about. So I'm going to leave that one. <laughs> but, um, you know, I know that you've got a, a huge love of music and also martial arts. So just wanting to give you a bit of space if you want to chat about that and the role that the, that they play in your life and maybe some of the influences that you've got from there. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I'd love to. You know, when I was a kid growing up in the res, music really helped me imagine other parts of the world. You know, it helped me connect with uh, certain emotions that I maybe didn't realize were accessible to me as a result of like the, the the tangible reactions you can have to music, right? And and it was all genres really that I grew up with. And I give credit to my parents for being, you know, music fans too. Uh, but when, when I was, you know, coming into my own tastes in, you know, the late eighties, early nineties, it was a lot of like hard rock, heavy metal and a lot of hip hop too. Um, and I think what I gravitated towards mostly with those genres specifically, like heavy metal and hip hop, is that it was outsider music. And I definitely felt like an outsider, you know, growing up on the res, you know, growing up on an island uh, across from a town, a prosperous town, right? Like we could literally see the outside world uh, prospering before our eyes, you know, and and we had a really, I think, clear understanding as to who we were as marginalized people back then in the 80s. So, yeah, like bands like Public Enemy, uh, you know, it's some Metallica, too, in the 80s, touched on a lot of those themes. And then in the early 90s, you know, bands like Rage Against the Machine were very influential on me, uh, Nine Inch Nails and so on. So I gravitate more towards those, you know, that heavier music still, but I, I still love all genres. And as, as someone who tries to create on a regular basis as a writer, you know, I, I try to absorb as much art as possible to draw inspiration, to be motivated and so on. So mu listening to music is a big part of my routine. You know, I listen to music before I write, you know, some very specific kinds of music, mostly music by Indigenous uh, artists uh, to really, I think, get my head in a space of, of, of reclamation, of, of sovereignty, of resilience, um, to go into the writing process, I think, really empowered. And then when I write, I, I usually listen to more ambient kind of stuff, uh, some more instrumental like heavy metal. Um, and especially with the last two books, you know, that explore dystopian landscapes, um, that really helps me like uh, find movement throughout that process and envisioning like something epic, I guess you could say, right? Uh, so that's where music, I think, factors in. But, you know, it's it, it's it's a daily process for me to engage with music and and witnessing live music is one of the most special things uh, to me. It always has been since I was about, you know, 13, 14 years old. Right. Uh, so I think to 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 complement or alleviate uh, some of the more intense emotions that can, you know, arise from focusing on our history or the issues that have, you know, defined us as Indigenous people or the intensity that comes from listening to heavy metal music. Uh, I do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, I'm a brown belt. I've been at it for about 13 years now. And what I find there is a really sort of cerebral yet intensely physical practice of really connecting my mind and body for the sake of my overall well-being, you know? 
Uh, Jiu-Jitsu is a very intense uh, martial arts. Um, it's yeah, it's very rigorous. You know, it, it requires a lot of skill and a lot of strength, but a lot of thinking too. So it's like the perfect combination for me, in my opinion, to you know escape what I need to, and I think work through whatever you know issues I may have mentally or emotionally or anything like that right so I always encourage you know indigenous people especially to get into jujitsu because there's a strong sense of community there and um really like it it, it really I, I think creates uh a, a positive outlet for what could be some difficult things you know so uh so yeah those are you know, that's part of my self-care routine, I think, is listening to loud music and then going to wrestle on the mats for hours at a time. <laughs> so a question in there, do you have any recommendations for folks listening um, as far as Indigenous artists that they might uh, like to, to listen to? Oh, yeah. So, like, you know, I was saying I like to be inspired to, uh, you know, to to envision future or to celebrate, you know, how far we've come. Uh, the Nishinaabe artists specifically that I listen to are Melody McIver, um, Evan Red Sky, uh, Leonard Sumner, a band called Ambigaze. Um, So th these are bands, these are musicians that I think you know, fall into specific genres, but they take elements of of Nishinaabe culture and identity and even music and infuse that into, into what they're creating, right? So as, as someone who's engaging in like a, a literary form that has its own so-called canon, I guess, um, I'm, I'm sort of writing within those lines too, but at the same time, I'm bringing in, you know, my history, my culture and so on to, to sort of create something that looks ahead, you know, to create a future atmosphere. And I think those artists do that for me when I'm trying to do something similar on the page. Uh, but more broadly, I, I, other Indigenous artists from other nations uh, that, you know, help me get to that space are uh Tanya Tagak, obviously, uh the hallucination. Um you know, just so many that uh that really helped me, I, I guess, propel that kind of thinking forward, right? So so yeah, those are the ones off the top of my head. And I mean for for me too, um I don't write as much as I should. Like I kind of laughed when uh, when Kate had mentioned, you know, I'm working on my thesis. I've been working on that thesis for a few years now, so I just need to write. But um, you know, thinking when you had mentioned about live music and going to concerts and how much energy that gives you, um, I do want to give a, a quick shout out to Ishkode Records and Digging Roots and Asanavi and Amanda Room oh, yeah. and those folks who are just like, you know, what a what a wonderful way to bring people together through music. And uh, so I do encourage folks who are on this call, um, please, please give a listen to these brilliant Indigenous um, musical artists who are just like Asanabi just blows my mind, have to say. Mm. Yeah. Um, and one of my last questions, Bob, for you, um, do you have any reading recommendations for folks? Um, any books or other works by Indigenous authors that you'd like to give a shout out to? Yeah, well, the easiest answer would be to go go check out the Story Keepers podcast, but <laughs> I won't uh, I won't just pass the buck there. Um, you know, the the last book I read uh, by an Indigenous writer is called uh, Probably Probably Ruby by Lisa Bird Wilson, a um, T writer from Saskatchewan. Uh, it's a story about uh, a young woman who was adopted out as an infant and her journey to, you know, find family and find an identity and so on. And it's just, it's so profoundly written, you know, it, it, it's, it's heartfelt, it's tragic, it's really, really funny. Um, we're actually going to be talking about that uh, on Story Keeper soon. Um, I'm really looking forward to reading uh, Bad Cree by Jessica Johns. Uh, you know, I've heard nothing but good things about it. So uh, that's next on my list. Um, you know, it just the one of the, uh, I think, uh, best books I've read recently uh, is A Minor Chorus by Billy Ray Belcourt. Uh, he's a Cree uh, writer from from out west, uh, originally from northern Alberta. Um, yeah, minor chorus just just totally blew my mind. Um, 
There's a book by a Métis writer from Edmonton named Connor Kerr. Uh, it's called Avenue of Champions. Uh, it's about the urban uh, Métis experience. And another really cool book is, is by that I came out last year uh, is called uh, All the Quiet Places by Brian Thomas Isaac. Um, he's he's in his I think he wrote it when he was in his late sixties. And it's about it's a coming of age story, I think, loosely based on his own upbringing in the Okanagan in B.C. Um, But I I like to highlight him and I like to highlight Michelle Good, too, who are writers who, you know, you would consider as elders who are publishing their debuts that, you know, are really revolutionizing the literary world. So Michelle Good's novel Five Little Indians, obviously, is just is just phenomenal. Right. Uh, so yeah, you, you know, the more I think about it, the more I could go on and on and on, but, uh, those are just a few. Absolutely. Um, normally on for anyone who else has, has been on any of these other calls, I normally have my bookshelves behind me of like, you know, all these brilliant, brilliant indigenous authors. And so I'm one of those people, like, if you ask me, like, I'm going to send you my spreadsheet that I have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, cool. Um, and so, you know, one, one last thing, you know, opening it up, is there anything else you'd like to mention? Just really totally opening up the floor to you, Wob. Uh, no, I, you know, this has been a really enjoyable conversation. Thank you very much, Christine. I, I really appreciate all your, your thoughtful and thorough questions. You know, you've made me feel really at home and really comfortable here. Um, no, I, you know, we touched on all the things that are important to me and, and, uh, maybe when the, the questions come in from the audience, some things will come to mind, but, um, I'm, I'm happy to, with how things have gone so far. So thank you. Well, this, uh, this brings us to that, the close of the formal, formal, um, portion of this conversation. So letting folks, um, who are joining us today, if you do have any questions, please add them into the chat. Um, but Wab, with my whole heart, Chi Miigwech for spending this time with me today, um, for your contribution to the What Stories Does a Land Hold series, and really just for the work that you put out into the world and and really how you are being this, this leading voice um, for aspiring Indigenous authors and, you know, creating those spaces for Indigenous stories. Um, as well, you know, Chimi Gwich for sharing about your work, about your family, about what inspires you and about what allows you to balance yourself um, in this world. And so at this point, um, we are opening up questions. So I do have a few of them in the chat. Um, let me just open up my, my chat function here. There we go. I don't have a computer mouse, so I'm like kind of lost and like my I'm like precariously balancing my laptop here. <laughs> um, OK, so the first one, is there a very short story that you grew up with? Maybe one that you could that you tell your boys now that you could share or a short passage from your upcoming book. So is there something, a story of some sort you'd like to share? Oh, uh... You know, I, some Nanabush stories I, I do like to share with them. Uh, you know, the ones I grew up with. Um, there's one that's in Moon of the Crested Snow that I've shared with them before about uh, Nanabush and the geese. Uh, it, it, you know, it, it'll take too long for me to tell the whole thing, but it's it's basically a, the moral there is to make sure you're prepared for winter and to not be greedy and so on. Um, there's a story about how the bees got their stingers, a Nanabush story. We actually have a book of that, that, that was written back in the seventies. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't want to take up too, too much time of, of reciting one of those whole stories, but, uh, yeah, I think what one major, uh, element to those stories is how concise they can be, but also how fluid they can be too, because you can hear, uh, similar Nanabush stories um, or trickster stories across Indigenous nations, right? So that harkens back to the oral sharing internationally that happened pre-contact. 
and how, you know, a story that maybe originated in Anishinaabe territory ended up in, you know, Cree territory with, you know, different uh, narrative elements and so on, right? So, you know, to me, that's that's really the the, the practice of, of uh, sharing the fundamentals, but also modifying them on your own, I think is really important to uh, engage in that oral practice, right? And, and yeah, just telling our kids, those stories, you know, whenever we can, like at story time, we should probably do it a lot more, actually. But, uh, you know, we've been a little busy with our little guy. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, having that focus on that gathering, that sort of communal sharing is uh, an essential part, you know, not just of being the schnabe. I think every culture around the world has that oral backbone. And I think we could all do better by practicing a little bit more. Absolutely. Chimmy Gwich. Second question. Um, one of the things that I found so moving in Moon of the Crusted Snow was your depiction of leadership, especially in a time of crisis. Can you share about how you think about the relationship between leadership and community? Oh, yeah. Th thanks for bringing that up. Um, it, it was really important for me to try to, um, you know, explore that issue, I guess, uh, in a in a colonial context, uh, you know, I was raised with the knowledge that the ancestors uh, from whom I'm descended uh, led in a very communal way, which was really, I think, rooted in the women. Uh, there, what I'm told is that there was an elder group of women that would usually make the decisions, usually would confer amongst themselves. And then instruct the younger men to go out and and carry out, you know, the decisions that they made. So by the time sellers arrived, that meant, you know, the women would say, OK, here's what we want you to go trade for uh, with them. Here's what we want you to bring to the negotiating table and so on. But that obviously was severely damaged by the patriarchy of colonialism and specifically the passage of the Indian Act into law, which implemented the modern chief and council system on reserves across Canada, as we know it today. So many nations and communities had, you know, governing chiefs and councils. But how we know it now is a system that's been created by the federal government. And once that came into our community, it pushed the women to the side. And of course, because the Canadian government has been historically patriarchal, that favored the men in our community. And they were elected to roles of leadership like chief and council, and, and the women were neglected. So in the community in Moon of the Crested Snow, you sort of have this fragile leadership that is exposed as fragile in this time of crisis. You know, you have this chief who uh, has good intentions, but may not necessarily be have the tools to lead this community through this difficult time, right? So that really shakes the foundation of that leadership system that has been imposed upon this community. And once it falls away, then the community sort of rises more in the group setting to figure out the best outcomes for it, you know, and the best responses to this crisis, both uh, externally and internally, because, you know, you have the arrival of this bad guy who's starting to take over the community. So that all that to say, you know, I don't like totally um, uh, despise or discredit the modern chief and council system because I fully support the chief and council in my home community, uh, partially because I'm related to half of them. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think we have to support the leaders that we have. But it's an important to recognize the historical context of how many of our traditional governance systems have been overruled by the modern chief and council system. So I'm glad, uh, you know, readers are able to pick up on that discussion that I tried to put forth in the community. And hopefully um, it opens the, it peels back the curtain a bit to, you know, different ways of thinking about how we govern ourselves for sure. Yeah, and reading through certainly, you know, it's like kind of a brilliant commentary that you you might miss um, reading through, but in in a community. So I also belonging to a community where, um, you know, that that sort of governing system that's been imposed on us. You can see that there are these these fractures that have that potential to really widen 
but then you can, you know, if you turn, I don't, I don't want to say turn back as in go backward, but really if you instead look toward those ancestral practices where we come together as community and where we're able to value everyone as part of community, having that, um, having a valuable contribution, I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of good that can come from that, certainly, and having even community kind of cohesion and, and you know, appreciating those kinship ties and the roles that we all play in community. Oh, absolutely. hundred percent. And so another question is, um, after the foundation of learning storytelling in your community and then training in journalism, was novel writing a shift? What varies and what connects how you write in these different forms? Great question. Um, I think I was probably first uh, intrigued by novels before journalism. And, you know, a, a big part of that is I never anticipated becoming a journalist either. Um, I wasn't aware of the path to that profession when I was in high school because it wasn't really presented to me as an option, you know, despite being someone who was interested in communications and, you know, um, was well read and was keen on writing and so on, right? So it was English class that I really favored the most when I was in high school. And and I think a lot of that is um, my, uh, I, I think, interest in storytelling in general coming from my home community and, and really uh, learning about different ways of writing and telling stories and so on. I think that's why I like novel writing at first. Um, but, you know, I back then, uh, Indigenous authors weren't part of the provincial curriculum at all, uh, nor were Black authors, really. It was mostly like white men that we read in the provincial curriculum in Ontario back in the 1990s, right? So fortunately, I had uh, an aunt who uh, showed me books by Indigenous authors. Um, she knew that I was keen on English class, and she asked me once who I was reading, and I listed off just basically white guys to her. <laughs> and uh, I think she was not impressed about that. So she started giving me books by Indigenous authors, you know, by, like Lee, uh, like Richard Wagamese, uh, like Louise Erdrich. And, and that was totally mind blowing as a teenager, right? To finally see experiences like mine reflected back at me from the page. To see universal experiences um, that I could relate with as an Indigenous person and learn about how to write about them and also to, um, you know, learn about some other specific nations and specific res experiences that weren't like mine either. Uh, so that's really what motivated me to want to become a writer someday. But getting into journalism is is a much longer story, uh, and it was something I didn't plan on doing. Uh, but I was uh, on a student exchange um, when I was in my second last year of high school uh, to Germany for a year, uh, and I had the opportunity to write articles about that experience. And that was the first time I realized you could write like in a day to day, real way and connect with readers and be true to certain people's experiences and get paid to do it, you know, because I didn't have any teachers in high school saying, oh, you should become a journalist. So that's how I got into journalism, right? And I went to university for it and then eventually started working for CBC and so on. Um, but what I really enjoyed about that, again, was the opportunity to be a conduit for real people, especially for Indigenous people, because back then there weren't really, uh, th there was, just a general lack of awareness in terms of Indigenous history, but also in terms of real issues facing Indigenous communities uh, in the mainstream media, right? So I think that's what really uh, catalyzed that career for me. And the whole time I was writing fiction as a hobby, you know, so it was always something I was doing on the side and, and had hoped to eventually get published one day. Uh, but I saw them for a long time as two totally separate ways of writing. I, I saw journali journalism, broadcast journalism specifically, that I was trained to do as um, more utilitarian, like as a way to be, I think, uh, active and to the point um, and, and to really, I think, concisely write about or show an issue or a story or whatever else. And then when I would write fiction, 
in the evenings when I was home or on the weekends, I saw that as an opportunity to, you know, be more descriptive, be more experimental and creative and so on. But it wasn't until I wrote Moon of the Crescent Snow that I saw how those things could combine and how I really need to really needed to rely on, you know, that active style of writing that I'd used as a journalist for a long time in writing like a thrilling post-apocalyptic story, right? And it was my editor, Susan Renouf at ECW, who really showed me that, who, who really encouraged me to play up those um, writing styles, I guess. Uh, so I think it was just a matter of, you know, understanding how uh, different styles of storytelling or writing can weave together, uh, depending on the project that you're undertaking. Um, but more or less understanding the overall objective you have in mind in the story you want to do and just using the proper tools for that. Right. Uh, so writing moon of the turning leaves has been much of the same approach of, of, you know, trying to be as active as possible, trying to keep a very good pace uh, to keep the reader interested and so on. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's just, I try to remind myself to have fun while I'm doing it too. And, and to be grateful that, uh, I've ended up in this position. And so what advice would you, uh, would you give yourself as a brand new writer? If you could look back and like, you know, sit, sit and talk with a younger Wob, what would you say as an early writer? <laughs> uh, Hmm, that's a really good question. Uh, I would say um, probably to write more, actually. Uh, you know, I wrote all the time. Um, and maybe to experiment more because I thought I had this very rigid idea of how I was supposed to write, which was not journalism, right? I had this idea that, oh, Fiction is my opportunity to be really descriptive and to and to sort of, um, you know, focus on like very specific things, whereas that does, doesn't necessarily work in storytelling, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I would say try I would have said to myself, you know, try to try different things, um, work harder at figuring out like your own style. But those things all came organically eventually anyway. And I probably wouldn't have had the time to do more writing than I did anyway, because I was working full time as a journalist. Right. Uh, but always read more. And this is what I tell young, young writers or aspiring writers. Like you have to read if you want to write, you know, there, there's just no question about it. You have to read all different kinds of fiction to understand what works and to figure out what kind of writer you want to be. Um, cause if you don't like, uh, you, you can't do it alone on, on just like what comes out of your head. You have to see the art in practice and you have to absorb as much of that art as possible to be inspired on your own. So, uh, yeah, I would have told myself to read a lot more too. And so do you keep practice of being in nature or connecting with the land as a way to inspire your writing or even just to relax? Oh, yeah, I do, for sure. You know, fortunately, we're, we live in Sudbury. Um, we're really close to downtown, but we have a backyard that goes out into the bush. So I can, so you can probably hear our, our little guy there in the background. Um, I, uh, yeah, I take a walk through the bush. Uh, you know, maybe I'll sit there for a few minutes if I can. Uh, we live close to what's called Ramsey Lake here in Sudbury. It's about a 10 minute walk away. I'll go down there just to sit by the water um, whenever I need to. And, and fortunately, you know, my home community is only an hour and a half south of here, uh, hour and a half so drive south of here. So, uh, yeah, uh, our family goes down there pretty regularly just to spend time on Georgian Bay. So, yeah, that is an essential part of, of what I try to do as a storyteller is just be be present in nature, uh, appreciate it, respect it, try to understand it and, you know, do my best to nurture it at the same time, because that's my responsibility as a citizen. And so one final question. Do you write using your Indigenous language? Uh, a little bit, yeah. Um, not in any sort of uh, fully uh, creative way, because I'm not a fluent speaker at all. You know, I have probably the skills of of a toddler, perhaps. You know, my my goal is to be a fluent speaker eventually. Uh, but I do include uh, Nishnabemwin dialogue, um, you know, in, in all of my work, essentially. Um, and the purpose is to make it 
live in literature to have it represented on the page, you know, in an English text, you know, which is largely a tool of the colonizer, right? It, it was a form of oppression. And to have Nishna Bemwin in there, I think, is an act of resistance, but it's a triumph at the same time. So even though an entire novel, uh, the entire novel doesn't exist in the language, there are elements of the language throughout. And I advocate for that constantly, you know, I, I ensure Sure that those moments are in there. And if there's any sort of pushback against that, you know, I, I take it very seriously. So, uh, and it mostly just shows up in the form of dialogue in my writing. Uh, but I want to show like Nishinaabe characters being able to speak their language because I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Being able to speak their language, but also having Nishinaabe names as well, too. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's obviously part of my upbringing. Uh, I was given my name at birth. You know, it's my legal name. Um, my parents worked really hard to ensure they gave me that name in a proper way. They consulted with my grandmother uh, and they just wanted to give me something that um, connected me to my culture, my language, my family, my community that I could express on a daily basis. So, you know, we've done that for our own children and I do that for my characters, too. And uh, it's, it's a real privilege to be able to do that. Um, so we're coming to the close of our time together today. So, Wab Chimigwish, thank you so, so much for, for conversation today. Um, and Chimigwish to everyone who has stayed along with us for this conversation um, and will, you know, hopefully join us in the future through podcast or recording and so on. Um, and at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Kate from the Center for Humans and Nature to bring us to a close. Thanks, Christine. And thank you. Thank you, Wob, so much. This was a fabulous conversation. I uh, made a little book list I'm going to drop in the chat based on Wob's recommendations, but I also want to get a playlist. Okay. So I'm thinking maybe I can go back. We can put some links together. Maybe Christine, you can help me and we can spit that out with the recording of this so that folks can listen and, and, um, and hear those artists that you uplifted earlier on the call. That was so great. Really appreciate the conversation today. Um, just want to reiterate what, what, uh, Kira mentioned at the top of the call that you can find all the recordings for this series of uh, events at the New Schools website in their audio and video library. This one will be included once it's produced in a few weeks. Um, and for everyone listening, if you haven't yet read Wab or Christine's work, visit humansandnature.org. You can see their essays in this series. Also visiting the links that are shared in the chat. Um, and I really encourage everyone to, to pick up a copy of uh, Wob's novel, especially Moon of the Crusted Snow. Like, get ready for the for, for part two coming our way. Um, and then finally, just quick mention that the later in this spring, the Center for Humans and Nature will be publishing a new question in our Questions for Resilient Future series, and that is, how do we come together in a changing world? This is curated by our 2023 editorial fellows, Kailea Frederick and Kate Viner. So look to our um, newsletter and homepage for announcements about the publication um, when, that, when that is released. Thank you all so much for joining us today. And Kira and Ken and Commonweal, thank you for making space for this conversation. It's really great. Thanks, Kate. And Wab and Christine, uh, so much gratitude to you for, for the conversation and your time here and for being willing to share your stories and your journey and your news. Um, as Kate said, we'll have our recordings posted in about, uh, I think we're working at two weeks at this point, and you'll find them um, on all of our media outlets. And we hope that you'll join the new school um, and the Center for Humans and Nature for other events and for their question series, which is gonna be um, wonderful. So Christine Lokasavich, Wagizik Rice, and the Center for the Human for Humans and Nature's team. Thank you for being with us at the New School at Commonweal. We'll see you next time, everyone. Don't take it, don't 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 